Hello, everyone. Um, welcome all to our third speaker series session in 2021. My name is Christoph Lütke. I am a professor of business ethics at the Technical University of Munich, and I'm also the director of the Institute for Ethics in Artificial Intelligence. With our speaker series, uh, the TUM Institute for Ethics in AI invites experts from all over the world to talk about ethics and governance of AI. These events serve as an important platform for sharing new research and exchanging knowledge. This event marks already our 12th uh, speaker series talk since our launch in 2019. Through our virtual events in particular, we were able to reach an even broader audience from around the globe. So we are looking forward to hearing from you today during our discussion. Today, we are very delighted to have with us Selina Bettino, uh, who is project director at the ITS Rio here today to talk about AI governance and policy in the global south. Allow me to say a few more things regarding our distinguished guest speaker. Uh, Celina Bottino was a researcher at the Human Rights Watch in New York and a consultant for the Harvard Human Rights Clinic. She is currently developing research in the human rights and technology field. She is affiliated with Harvard's Berkman Klein Center and project director, director at the Institute for Technology and Society of Rio de Janeiro. Celina Bottino has a master's degree in human rights from Harvard University and an undergraduate degree in law from the Pontifical University um, um, Rio. Before we begin now, I would like to ask you to turn off your microphone and camera during the session and submit your questions via chat or uh, alternatively raise your hand. Uh, we will try to answer as many questions as possible. Also, let us know in the chat if you are experiencing technical difficulties. So, Celina, without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you, Christoph, for the nice introduction, Caitlin and Manuela for organizing this, um, this talk. Uh, can you guys hear me well? Okay, um, I'll just put this on so I think it will be better. And I will um, share my screen here to start our, the presentation. Uh, and let me just check. Okay. All good. Okay. Yes. So hi everyone. Well, good morning here from Brazil. I'm in Rio de Janeiro right now. Uh, and it's uh, a pleasure to be here talking to you about this topic. And again, thank you for the Global and AI Ethics Consortium for this invitation and opportunity. I'll this is a nice photo I'll, I'll, in the, uh, my talk, I will get back to it, but it is just uh, the photo of this AI and inclusion symposium we organized in Rio in 2018, where we uh, invited and had more or less uh, 400 researchers from around the globe, just uh, specifically to talk about AI and inclusion. And it was key that it was held uh, in the global south, but I'll, I'll get back to it with, uh, in the talk. So uh, as Christoph mentioned, I'm project director at ITS Rio. ITS is the Institute of Technology and Society at Rio de Janeiro. It's a think tank uh, located here in Brazil. And this is the nice view of our office. Uh, so everyone is invited once it's possible to uh, travel. Uh, it's so our mission here is to ensure that uh, Global South and Brazil responds creatively, creatively and appropriately to all the opportunities provided by technology in this digital age and all the potential benefits that are broadly and that potential benefits are broadly shared across society. So uh, that so AI is obviously one of the topics that we're engaging in, but we're also working on other issues relating uh, democracy and technology, uh, government and technology. So whoever has any interest, please feel free to have a look at our, at our page and we'll be happy to 
answer any questions about also our work. So as I mentioned, I'm, I'm project director, uh, has an affiliate also to the Berkman Kind Center, will not uh, move a bit faster in this part. But anyway, uh, I would like to introduce here the, the roadmap of, of this conversation, which I will be uh, structuring this, uh, this talk on uh, comparing these six uh, topics from perspectives from the global south and global north, right? Because uh, sometimes it's, I think it's useful to give a bit, uh, some steps back to before engaging in the policy discussion regarding AI. So, because we uh, think we cannot talk about AI specifically from this global south perspective without mentioning connectivity and basic infrastructures, for example, which are crucial for the use of AI. And then I will put, compare briefly uh, the AI national strategies from countries from the global north and global south, and also uh, how these research, how is research on this topic divided between countries from these two regions. Uh, and finally, I'll touch upon how the data ecosystem that is also crucial, uh, it's a crucial topic for this, uh, for this discussion. And finally, uh, how universities can have a role in this also in this, uh, in this topic. So first point is about uh, connectivity, right? It's still, as mentioned, uh, it's key, right? Uh, when talking about AI and its applications, as they need to be connected. So uh, as it may be something uh, gi uh, given, <laughs> depending on where you're located, it's not actually the reality for everyone, right? So this slide uh, shows this animation of IP uh, use address usage in 2013. Of course, it's a bit outdated, but anyway, it still shows the differences um, of, you can see the concentration of the spots, lights on as all, most uh, uh, Europe, United States, and also, for example, in Brazil, in the in the main cities around the coast, for example, whereas Africa is still very poorly uh, poorly connected. No things has changed, but still uh, not as much to see uh, a whole map with all these lights all these lights up. Uh, and here you can see. Uh, the difference in percentage of individuals using internet in each country. Also, it's uh, from 2016, but still, again, there's still a significant difference between uh, global north and global south, whereas in Europe and North America, for example, almost 100% uh, of connection of individuals that are, uh, are connected, while rates in Africa, for example, around 20 to 30, sometimes 10%. Again, just very, very briefly, just to put up the point that uh, this is something that should be taken into consideration when talking about AI. And to complement this connectivity scenario, I think it's also, because we're gonna see how it, this is important one example, I will, uh, I will tackle in further on the conversation. But still, um, there is a difference of quality regarding quality and speed of internet connections while, which is also very important for running certain uh, internet, uh, for certain AI applications. And again, the average of speed between, uh, from countries from the global north and global south are still very significant. And as a last matter, which is, is curious, but I think it's, it makes it, it's also uh, interesting, is that size matters, right? So uh, you see here, Taiwan has one of the highest average speeds in the world, but it's also a very, very small country. Whereas Brazil has a very low average speed, but still like 230 times larger than Taiwan. So there's much more physical infrastructure to cover all the area. So these are like some, just a, um, some important, I think topics that may be not in the radar when we talk about AI and governance, but we see that it, when it comes to the practical uh, uses and of AI applications, these issues have a different, are important and should be taken in, into consideration. So moving forward from connectivity to infrastructure, which is also uh, related, uh, I would like to, to talk uh, here, 
one of the first, uh, maybe one of the first uh, AI applications where people will be more um, used to in the coming years could be, there will be the autonomous transportation, right? Which uh, it was interesting because uh, I don't know if you guys are aware, but I, I imagine so the 100 year studies from Stanford, which said that uh, I think 200, uh, 2020, they said it will be like millions of uh, auto autonomous vehicles driving around, which the prediction was not really right, but still it's something that we'll see uh, in the near future. But, and again, right, these self-driving cars require connections and map applications to work. So, uh, and here it's a picture regarding uh, Brazil, uh, one specific area in, in Rio, showing how important parts of the city are still not on the map. So if you need these, AI, these uh, map applications to use all these uh, self-driving cars, uh, not all areas are on the map. So they will already become excluded from these, these possibilities. Here, just to illustrate, Copacabana, one of the most uh, known um, right, uh, tourist sites in Rio is, uh, you can see all these buildings, but a bit just behind, sorry, just behind it, you can see this, uh, these slums, it's the favela Contagalo, which does not appear here on the, on the Google Maps. So that's something also we were, it's something that's being discussed already a long time, uh, that all these applications should uh, include and be updated to, ha to not exclude even more these areas that are already naturally, uh, naturally excluded. So that's also another uh, point to, to bear in mind. Again, uh, homes, services, uh, and, and service robots, which will already very common places on people's houses, especially on, I, I would say, on countries from the, the global north. So these were probably the, mo the first forms of automation that entered on people's house. Uh, but, and houses are becoming even more uh, intelligent and with all these various interconnected appliances. But again, if you see the reality in some places here is still like there's no electricity. So, uh, so there is a really still big divide and gap that still needs to be bridged and, and take into consideration when we start to talk about uh, policy. So moving to policy strategies here, um, ITS did a mapping of the AI national, po national policy strategies from a total of around 35 uh, countries uh, that were mapped. And it was interesting to see the divide between how many of these map of these documents were from countries from the global north and from the global south. So here is part of this report that we did uh, showing on green uh, the places, the uh, countries where they already had developed these AI national strategy plans. Again, mostly of these uh, countries uh, on the global north, while uh, uh, the yellow one is the countries where they are in development, they're still developing these AI national strategy plans. And the gray part which countries that still did not uh, move forward with these, uh, with these plans. Maybe it's not, a, this, this map was done like a year ago, it's not completely updated, but still, I think it's it's enough to show the difference between the number of like 29, 27 national strategies from the global north, while eight national strategies from countries from the global south, which are not, not necessarily all national strategies, but still some, uh, in any way, some initiatives along those lines. And um, here is, an, I imagine most of you are already familiar, but it's also, it's nice to remember that the Future of Life Institute created this uh, this ref this uh, uh, mapping and uh, the list of all these national strategies, which is a useful resource for uh, researching and normally, and it's up for people to update it. So it's 
again, it's a nice uh, source of information on this topic. And this is uh, just to give a bit of a backdrop on, um, on this discussion here in Brazil. This is Aldo Rabelo, which is a former science and technology minister. And uh, besides here is a bill of law that he presented a lot, some time ago, uh, prohibiting automation of the public sector. So uh, this, I think, shows a bit how there's still very misconceptions and uh, different ideas and views on the benefits and the perils and uses of automation and any AI application, especially uh, in the public sector. So it's, but it's, I think, it's significant to show how uh, that an, a bill of law was presented with this, uh, with this. Uh, objective the, the with the objective to prohibit any automation in the public sector and we already have fortunately did not move forward but still we have already some and brazil is currently discussing a very big and comprehensive uh digital government um, um bill of law which will change a lot of how technology may use may be used to better serve to provide better services for people which will obviously and sometimes have to be have uh, will use some automation, which uh, so this is I think is uh, significant to, to show how there's still a lot of work to be done on this topic uh, with policymakers specifically. And uh, ITS is also doing as research mapping other AI initiative other bill of, of laws that uh, tackle AI and there's already around 20 and it's very interesting to see how uh, like the definitions are very different one another you can see there's really lack of knowledge from these uh, policymakers with the topic so I'll just I'll uh, I'll talk a bit about what I regarding the scenario what ITS is doing to try and help to move forward this debate in a way that will not um, cur curb innovation, but still guarantee that uh, AI applications are developed in a responsible and ethical manner. So this report uh, is, this report are show, are analyzed all existing laws and how they would be applied uh, now to, to AI applications to see, to show that not necessarily it's uh, there's no laws that will be applied to these applications that will change the world or whatever. Uh, you see, there's to show that there, the laws, existing laws, they will, where, which points that already be applicable and which is, the, what, which are the gaps that may be a kind of a more pr uh, principle-based uh, document should be drafted instead of a hard-based law. So this is still ongoing we can share once once we're done with with this research and again so and this uh i think it's also very very significant to show how the concentration of ai research is uh is, is divided right so again with these numbers we can see how the global north countries are still heavily the producers while global south consumers are of these uh technologies so uh, with uh, based on the research of uh, OCDE, uh, there from the 2,000 main companies on research and development, 93% of the AI patents are from companies located in seven countries, being Japan, the first one, South Korea, United States, Taiwan, China, Germany, and France. Again, this is not super updated, but again, but still, I think very significant of how this debate on, on and how the topic of research in AI is still heavily concentrated on very, and then not just North countries, but still very few countries, right? So that's something also for us to, to bear in mind when uh, discussing policy and governance of AI in, a, in, a, uh, in, a, in, a, in general. And research has to do also with education. And again, here is how it's an, um, an example of how uh, AI has been introduced, for example, in the 80s with at the MIT Media Lab, this Mindstorm Lego kit. And there is now 
many other AI applications being used with to uh, in education. Uh, but again, when we see Brazil, it's another uh, another point that we're still very far behind when most of the schools are still not connected to uh, to the internet. So they really uh, still lack basic infrastructure. This is something else ITS is working on. How to provide how uh, how to make uh, a plan to helping the government to provide uh, internet to public schools, which uh, it's something that's still uh, it's still an issue, <clears throat> and still uh, present obstacles for all these development of the uses of these new uh, new applications. Uh, and now moving to this, uh, the data ecosystem point, which I think is one of the most interesting uh, issues here for us to discuss that again, I think sometimes people are, does not, uh, is not aware of these very specific, very simple uh, points that makes a real difference. Uh, and this is related to the formats uh, of data, right? So very briefly, this is, uh, very like very uh, simplified list of some potential benefits and challenges. So uh, here <clears throat> uh, pointed some potential benefits on the use of AI specifically regarding uh, the medical use. So with more information, it can help uh, human decision processes, like doctors can make better decisions based on more information that all these uh, uh, AI applications may give. They are more precise analytics for pathology images. Uh, it also may help managing hospital capacities and patient services in a better way, as we'll see in an example just right after here. But again, the challenges are the lack of like usable data, the mismatch of data formats, in unstructured inputs, and incomplete records. So in Brazil, most of the uh, data regarding the health health in the health sector are not in a digital form are and are not structured in a way that is machine readable. So uh, even though there are some lot, very uh, interesting ideas of uh, startups that are on the, on the medical uh, area, they're trying to help uh, solve a lot of the problems in the health sector. But they mentioned, they say, well, we have to train our, our application using data sets from abroad because we just don't have these data sets here, which then we know will have uh, an impact on the result. As this example shows very well, I don't know, I, I, maybe it's, it's an already very well known example, but still, I think uh, it's very illustrative of what of this point, which is when uh, this Google uh, medical AI was super accurate in the lab, but in the real life, it was a, in, it was a different story. So uh, this is the research um, that was done in Thailand, where the the country's health minister set this annual goal to screen sixty percent of the people with diabetes for diabetic retinopathy. Which can cause blindness if not caused if not caught earlier, and this <clears throat> uh, and this Google uh, Health developed this AI that could identify the signs of diabetic ret retinopathy from an eye scan with more than ninety percent of accuracy, which in which the teams calls the like as if it was like human specialist level, um, and in principle it will give the result in less than ten minutes. And the system <clears throat> analyzes images from all the fraud tell, for telltale indicators for the conditions such as blocked or leaking blood vessels. But most of the images uh, of the recognition system using was trained, I, the, the, the deep learning model was trained based on really on high definition images. And the accuracy in the results was based on the good quality of data that the machine had. But, uh, and it was designed to reject images that was fed, that fell really below a certain threshold, right, of quality. And, uh, and this was put in practice, right? They, the nurses were scanning 
lots of of patients and uh and but and often here taking pictures in poor lighting conditions and more than a fifth of the images were rejected so they saw that uh, and again it took uh and another point that uh that plugs to what i was saying in the beginning another challenge that they had in, in the field was that uh the system use was read was plugged in the cloud so they needed a high speed internet connection which did not happen again so uh, you can see how all these points that i mentioned in the beginning has uh makes sense when you try and bring ai applications right to the real world and uh in this case the system has so had to upload the images from the cloud and with the good connection uh, this should be uh very fast but this in the real world it was taking hours just to screen a few patients so everything that was designed in the lab when went to the real world it was not actually how I, it was initially planned so this i think is a nice example to show how uh, implementing AI system in developing countries may be more challenging because of all these points of lack of infrastructure of, of good quality data and also another point which i will mention in and uh, after this one is the, the point of training people right so if you don't train people and if they are not uh, they don't have the skills necessary to use all these uh, ai applications again it, it it won't work so uh it's not as simple as putting something in the a very good idea very nice uh, ai application system but if not uh thought about in the, this multi-facet way, it, it won't be as the success as it that it should. And then finally, uh, getting to the this point of, of knowledge, which uh, has, I think, is a re also will be a re the result of part of the AI policy uh, documents and strategies that all these countries are are, are uh, implementing so we analyzed the most of these uh, ai strategy plans and we pointed at some four different areas to compare right and one of them was research and education so here's just pinpointing some of what uh some of these points that uh, we thought it was interesting regarding education. So Canada here wants to become a leader in AI training. It's investing 120 million, uh, 125 million to create research centers. Uh, South Korea is uh, creating six new AI schools up to 200, 2022 and training 5,000 specialists on AI. These are part of their uh, goals. China is creating five, 50 universities and research centers on AI. This five-year program having 500 professors and 5,000 students being formed again on, on AI. Mexico and Germany, they are planning to include AI in the school curriculum. And in Brazil, uh, it's still to be confirmed, but the plan is to create fix six, eight AI centers uh, at some point. So, but well, we know that these uh, all these uh, these uh, plans were thought about before, right? All these pandemics. So in the case of Brazil, I'm sure this uh, will like the time frame for this to be to actually happen will be obviously delayed. But we can see how um, the countries are worried about um, are planning to invest and uh, seeing education as a crucial point for uh, AI in as a whole and as a strat as a part of a strategy, right? So uh, also, feel, well, Canada is creating, wanted to create all these ecosystems so you can have to, to, um, uh, to attract good uh, researchers and then to have offer good employment. So like it's, and they are trying to offer the, the right infrastructure for that. And that's something that we listen from uh, researchers here in Brazil uh, of, and AI developers that unfortunately um, they 
they don't have the night not only as i mentioned the data infrastructure necessary but also um they're not offered enough like uh jobs and and that are paid well because research uh, scholarships are very very low so they are normally often having to move right so there are people from abroad uh find these these uh, national talents and just uh take them out away from the country. So one of the, the plan also here in Brazil is try to create this uh, a nice environment so that we don't need, so that the good uh, and like people and researchers that working on the area, that they could stay here and uh, then the, all the society can uh, have the results of, of, the, of, their, of their work. So that is something also very important to, to take into consideration. And um, again, going back to the picture from the beginning, uh, <clears throat> this is the final uh, picture. I'm there somewhere uh, that was taken on this AI inclusion event that, that ITS organized with the Berkman Klein Center and the NOC, the network of uh, network of centers on research on internet and research that up to date there's a, around a hundred and a uh, hundred and so research centers from around the world that is part of this of the NOC and this was the first global symposium on AI and inclusion and it gathered more or less 400 uh, researchers from around the world to discuss how to move forward with the AI debate and how to make it really inclusive. So this, uh, the event was organized in the museum of the, the, this is the Museum of Tomorrow, that's the name of the museum, which is located in the very, in the port area in, in, in Rio, which is being uh, re all re renewed. Uh, it's a very nice, it's uh, a very nice place, I don't know, if it's a, another go-to place once people are able to come and visit. But it, I think it was very significant to, to hold this event on this symposium two days inside a museum and inside a museum that it was named Museum of Tomorrow. So it was a really nice experience and all the, re, the results of the talks and discussions are on the AI and inclusion website. And here, see, this was uh, the event website where we, there were, uh, we organized, uh, there were, there's like this reading list on the topic. There is also uh, the research questions that since it was, this was, as I mentioned, 2018. And um, this uh, was the first time that the talk AI was being, uh, like framed in this way with a inclusion. So there was not much still material on the topic at the time. So, uh, and also which were like the research questions that should be perceived, uh, pursued by, by researchers in the future. So this is also uh, recorded here on the website for people to, to consult. And it's interesting to see this is one of the, of the results here that uh, when you define the de uh, defining the development of stages of an AI uh, system, you can see how the point of uh, the, how data will be collected in the model and targeting to target the specific audience of this AI tool is was one of the first topic that was uh, was pointed out. And also how in the development stage um, that the development stage should follow all this design process uh, and deployment again, uh, which will be which uh, which it should cover the distribution, initialization, implementation of AI-based technology within society at multiple levels, including the local, national, and global uh, ecosystems, and the evaluation and impact, right, <clears throat> which is a phase that should encompass the measurement and understanding of the impact of AI technologies, including ways to evaluate the effect of autonomous systems on different ages within society. So uh, this is also something that uh, was not very present before. And we were trying to, to 
include input this as an important aspect for all the of the development stages of of AI. And again, here uh, has also some of the mechanisms for interventions. Uh, so defining and framing. So thinking about again about the principles, bridging, and uh, building. So mechanisms containing questions related to building infrastructure such as networks and uh, linking between multiple stakeholders, education. So how um, both the education of AI-based technology as well as impact of AI may have on education. And also then and the finally policy making, how these questions should pertain to a set of principles, guide laws, guidelines, laws, and regulatory frameworks that uh, govern AI. So what's next? <laughs> Here, uh, bridging, uh, making this point and linking it with, I think, uh, the role of of university. So, oh, wait, um, with the role, I think the role of of university, and I, I like to uh, get back to this uh, text by Urs Kragas, uh, direct from the Berkman Klein Center, which. Uh, he points out that universities have specific roles on uh, the ethics and governance of AI as it's a place for research, right, and implementation. Uh, first, it's an open resource uh, community, right? So, uh, and also it's a place for research and experimentation where AI could be tested and where systems uh, and universities should also help develop systems to, uh, to a point to point the fairness and accuracy of AI systems and to do part of that monitoring, as I mentioned before, again, developing this impact analysis and also mechanism that should be accompanied by the development of AI. And it can also like convene meetings with researchers and different stakeholders, especially regarding considering that universities have different uh, areas and different schools within so having people from philosophy area, law, develop, uh, re, uh, scientists, and all of the capabilities and skills that require uh, when we are designing AI applications. And maybe one of the most important parts would be like translating AI mechanisms and describes it as applications to people as a whole. And because we know that uh, it's not a, of an uh, easy topic to for like a public as a whole to grasp and one and if you people and if um, the uses and uh, the deployment of it will depend on how people engage and use and you can only use if you understand and if you and if you trust so there is a lot of uh, of components that education and, and pa that passes through education and and knowledge as a whole and so here's one of the uh, some of the activities that ITS is is uh, planning to do and is already doing some in some points is that the, this capacity building. So we are doing uh, part of uh, we're doing courses and training sessions with policymakers, judges, civil society uh, organizations as a whole. So this is something that we already do with, with other topics, not necessarily related to AI, but now, for example, with data protection, it's something that, uh, and also internet laws as a whole, since, uh, and I think with the judges, it's a very, a very good example, since they are now being uh, called to decide upon a lot of these issues, which they probably did not have uh, classes on while they were, sitting back in university. So uh, we're trying to uh, help bridge this, uh, this gap on like on information and, and really explaining how, how the system works and because they, like the decisions cannot be untied, uh, cannot be disconnected with reality. So this is, uh, and we're, we're planning to do the same thing with policymakers regarding AI. As we as mentioned, when we saw all of these initiatives to to uh, tackle uh, AI, uh, we see there is a lot of asymmetry of information and in how it's important for uh, policymakers to understand at least what how the basic functions uh, and information about this how so that we don't have 
uh, laws that really, as I, as I showed before, that, for example, that try to prohibit any AI development, like in a broad sense. Uh, so engaging with multi-stakeholder meetings, again, really um, getting back from the inter all the internet governance debates. Uh, for those who are not aware, like the Marco Civil of uh, the Internet Bill of Rights that Brazil created was based on this multi-stakeholder uh, fashion. And we it was this first law that was created on the for the internet with by the internet with the internet where all different stakeholders and people from different stakeholders really, really uh, had a say. And it was a, the result of all these multiple different uh, views. Um, and as mentioned, we're doing these reports on AI in the developing world. And this was just a way we're trying to steer this debate in the global south. And I think key, key to this will be um, having the inclusive uh, perspective being uh, an important element of, of this debate. So really in a nutshell, I would say that the AI and policy debate needs uh, to be open to this imagination to try and which solve uh, po complex problems. The experimentation, as I mentioned, that we, that has to do with the role of also of universities where you can test different deployments and governance and that the debate needs to be really uh, multi-stakeholder and most importantly to be inclusive because if just having people from all these different countries in the same place discussing which will have uh, an important in the result of uh, a more inclusive and comprehensive uh, policy governance uh, document or, or guideline. So we really think that uh, we'll all learn and have a more robust and more complex and more complete uh, policy system, uh, document if we are open to hear the perspective from uh, different uh, different countries, especially, especially considering that uh, Global South will be like the consumers and mostly most probably be more impacted uh, on with will be more impacted with the deployment of these tools, which is so and more than uh, fair that they are all considered in those discussions since they also in a way part a part of the picture. So again, thank you. This, uh, I think now was almost on time over these uh, 40 minutes and I'll be happy, happy to, to discuss further these topics, which I think is very fascinating, uh, especially uh, when we start to see how uh, we are in specific issues, we're still very far behind <laughs> compared to, to other countries. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this fascinating um, new and fresh perspective. I, I don't think actually I uh, have to say Brazil is, is so far behind. Uh, when I look at, at all the things that go wrong in Germany's uh, digital infrastructure and and the way we um, take on AI now, it's, it's also not always the fastest. Um, Okay, uh, let's say we have a couple of questions here. Um, so <clears throat> here's one. Um, how do you think COVID will influence uh, the, the development and uptake of AI solutions, especially in the global south? Do you think it might help to increase uh, the awareness of policymakers for the need of such systems? Yes, I think definitely uh, the COVID pandemic really speeded, try, will have this uh, effect of speeding up lots of things, but well, we see already these examples of uh, like con showing the importance of connection. So uh, I think all these discussions will be, ha will, for, with the necessity, will have to be fast forward, right? Because. We, we don't have time to, to uh, lose anymore. And we see how uh, this, uh, how technology can be really helpful in trying, not even, for example, just applying it to helping uh, expedite like testes, tests and other, and all these contact tracing, also discussions. Uh, so 
I think uh, the COVID pandemic shows how technology really should be seen as an ally to human uh, solve to to human complex problems. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Uh, another question: uh, There's a risk that AI will deepen inequalities, considering connectivity and other presented factors. But on the other hand, what potential could AI-related technologies represent? towards a more fair and inclusive world. I think we've covered some of that, but maybe you can give some of my Yeah, so I think that's why I think it's fascinating as well as as the same time, it can it can uh, make it bigger this digital divide. It's, but if taken into uh, consideration and using it very thoughtfully, it can help bridge, the, have this leapfrog, right? You can try. Uh, and I think uh, the health system is one of the examples that uh, really AI could help use, uh, could help bridge all the gap. We can see some experiments already going on in Brazil, for example, with all these uh, ex uh, tests and exams that, uh, that the machines are, are able to do much better than people, than human and doctors. And there are a lot of, a lot of cities where there's almost no doctor. So, and people don't need to move to one city or to another to, to have them uh, screened and tested. So if you have just the, the, the main uh, appliance, you can, uh, the doctor can see it without needing to, to be there physically. So I think the telemedicine part has a really uh, uh, promising positive impact. Yes, thank you. Um, here's another one. In your experience working with civil society and multi-stakeholder groups, to what extent are communities in the global south, specifically Brazil, aware of the issues brought by big data and AI, such as data privacy and others? Do you know of any initiatives outside academia uh, and ITS to foster education and awareness in the communities? Oh, that's a good question, because uh, so we, we, we we make the joke that we are still crawling like a baby in a lot of these discussions, right? As a society as a whole. So I, and one of the specific one is regarding data privacy. So Brazil just now, last year in the middle of the pandemic had the, our data, data protection uh, law approved. And, uh, but it's very different than from Europe, which already had like the directive since 95, the GDPR is just a new one, but, with all these uh, culture of uh, data protection, which is almost non-existent here. So um, now the people are beginning to understand that there's this issue of, of privacy. And, but and one of the, I think, uh, challenges here is also how to make these two discussions move together and not one curb the other, right? So mm -hmm. one of the main issues that I see uh, that obstacle and like, the main uh, concerns that civil society as a whole and organizations have is, for example, regarding the use of uh, facial recognition cameras. So uh, <clears throat> there are some laws trying to, to prohibit the use, the, wide, the, the use and the uh, wide scale of, of these cameras, but not recognizing how also they, it can be helpful in specific circumstances, right? So, it cannot be a take or leave debate. They have to, how to find the, the mid way in which technology can be used for the best, for a positive impact, which is dependent on data protection, on, on data, right? So these two uh, discussions have to, to move together. Thank you. Uh, and another question in the chat. To what extent are governments from the global north interested in AI development of the global south? And that's something we also address, by the way, in, with, in another context uh, in our Responsible AI in Africa network. So, yeah, do you have any so, thoughts? On that? Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, I think it depends on which country you're, you're talking about. So, I, uh, it's maybe something that I can revert back to you <laughs> with mm -hmm. how the perspective from uh, which uh, how you think that uh, the countries from the global north are really interested in having this inclusion debate because from what we we see is more like people here trying to like knock on the door say hey 
we're here, let's try to talk and not much the opposite saying, come like opening the doors and creating avenues for, for people from the global south to, to enter this debate. Yeah, um, it's, it's a bit hard to judge. I mean, the, uh, the field is still very new. I mean, I, I would, I would see an, an interest uh, definitely for, from a number of European countries uh, in, um, in extending these questions. I mean, on the other hand, one has to say that Europe is also still, uh, I mean, not, not the most progressive uh, um, ad, ad, uh, advocate of AI. Um, so of course yeah. the, the situation is much more dynamic in the US and, and also in China. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so if you take also China, obviously as, as a government from the global north, I think they are interested also in, in developing AI in the global south. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a broad field, definitely. Uh, okay, here's another question. Acceptance of a technology by a population is hard to predict. Uh, do you think that Brazil's population is ready to take that jump? And if yes, how and why? I mean, you could ask the same about Germany. I'm not sure what the answer is. <laughs> so it's a, a good question. Uh, another maybe uh, point of information, which is I think is interesting, is that Brazil is still, there's a connection, uh, digital divide, but still is, I think just behind Philippines is the most, uh, is the, the population that all, the, that spends most of the time on internet those that have appliances are very, very connected. So Facebook is huge in Brazil. All these social networks are very, very uh, significant in, in the country because Brazilians are very fond of internet and connections. And uh, these numbers, the connection, uh, connectivity numbers are, are increasing each year and especially due to, to mobiles and portable devices what like so there's this uh, national uh, research all every year it's showing how these connectivity rates are are increasing and how and by which device so uh, I think more than 80 percent are connected only also almost exclusively because of with a, a, a smartphone which cannot not necessarily is, is that as a big so of a smartphone so I think Brazilians are are always more are open for new technologies, even though they maybe don't know much, <laughs> but they are, I think in the in general it will be they will be open for it. That's that's great to hear. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Um, here's a comment I get. Uh, uh, I agree that there should be more discussions, interaction between academics, government practitioners about the use of AI. Uh, AI for Belgium is a useful example on how this could be done. We need it also in the global south, but I don't think a regional division is needed. We should also explore interaction between north and south. So that's what we said already. Um, and uh, yeah. Um, another commentator says, the African Commission has just accepted a resolution on AI including reference to AI regu regulation. So Caitlin put that in the, in the chat, uh, as, as well as the AI for Belgium uh, link. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, I, I have a question in terms of, uh, uh, I mean, I was aware of, of the uh, similar to GDPR uh, development that, that was going on in Brazil. And uh, I, I was connected to some of the researchers there, but uh, is is that uh, is that um, the, the 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 debate that is going on about AI and AI ethics maybe are in Brazil? Is that connected? Is it is it is it or is it uh, because GDPR is one thing, but but it's not uh, all of uh, all about AI ethics, obviously. So it's, is it a different debate now? So it's a different debate, but I think taken, uh, but led by almost the same people <laughs> like oh, the would, okay. that would uh, be leading the discussions on data privacy and also uh, on AI, on AI and ethics as a whole, but it's still a very, very small part and mostly uh, concentrated in, in research centers and universities. So it's mm -hmm. not really still 
uh, widespread because as I mentioned, I think we still have a, a way to, to go with the topic of data protection, which will eventually uh, feed in the AI and ethics, uh, and ethics debate. But it's interesting, uh, uh, just remember that, I don't know if you guys are, uh, saw this UNICEF report that was re uh, released this, this, this week, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They, they, they did this workshop with adolescents and how showing in different uh, places. So it was in Brazil, it was in Sao Paulo and Manaus, which is a city in the very, in the North state of Amazon, the Amazon, um, Chile, Sweden, and the United States. So how the, these uh, young people saw AI. So it's interesting to see that the Brazilians uh, in Sao Paulo, which is a big city, uh, they how they they understood AI as being, and how are they being introduced to this topic, as being those uh, personal assistants and uh, the chatbots of banks. So banks uh, have these chatbots to help you. So that's their image of of AI and their view. Is also, I ah, do you think AI will solve the problem? Say, oh, yes, but in the future. So we see how the the view, and also from the the people from New York, it's interesting that they, they thought that AI would make people lazier because as if AI would do the <laughs> most of the work for, for a human. So it's interesting to see. It's I can share the report here too. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, and we have some short questions for uh, finishing before we have to wrap up. Uh, one question is, is in, in addition to data protection, is Brazil or any other can, country in South America exploring AI regulation? Yes. So as I mentioned, Brazil has some around 20 draft bills and is so our uh, regulate the AI national plan was put for public consultation. ITS pre pre uh, pre uh, participated. Uh, so it's still being uh, in the final dra drafting within the government, which again, the pandemic for sure made it uh, did the, the work slower. Mm -hmm. And do you think collaborations like the Global AI Ethics Consortium, uh, which we are part of, can contribute to closing the gap between the global North and South? Sure, I think that's a great uh, closing, almost closing question because I think these kind of initiatives are are exactly what one of the points that I was mentioned. So uh, having these not just multi-stakeholder but multi-regional discussions, and then and engaging with people from different places, which sometimes have uh, uh, have participation on some also governmental initiatives, which we can present the same time here. So, uh, and that already happened again with, again, on the topic of internet uh, law, we brought people from uh, Germany to talk about the net DG to Brazilian Congress to see that there was not necessarily the best, uh, very good idea. So that is exactly uh, what a good example of how we can uh, build upon and, uh, and encourage more of these uh, collaborations. Thank you very much for your talk. And with that, I hand uh, over for the closing remarks to uh, Caitlin. Hi, thank you so much, Selena. I just wanted to take a final moment to let everyone know about some upcoming events of the IAI. Our next speaker series will be uh, will take place on April 29th. Uh, virtually over Zoom again. And I'm pleased to announce the speaker for that session will be Professor Yi Zhang, who's the director of the Research Center for AI Ethics and Safety at the Beijing Academy for Artificial Intelligence. The topic of that event will be near and long-term challenges for creating ethical AI. And we'll have speaker series events uh, throughout the spring and summer, so we'll keep informing you about them. Uh, also to update you again on our Responsible AI Forum, it'll take place from the 6th to 8th of December at the Holiday Inn City Center in Munich. And the abstract submission date has been extended to the 30th of June. So please consider uh, participating in that with us uh, this winter. Last but not least, I want to, as always, remind you the best way to stay up to date with all of our news and events is to visit our website, sign up for our newsletter, and follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. Uh, so finally, I would once again like to uh, thank Selena so much for accepting our invitation and having this uh, really interesting discussion with us and thank all of you our audience members for your comments and questions. Um, and with that, I, I uh, say have a nice day to everyone. Thanks again. Thank you.
Thank you very much, people. And thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Have a good day.